Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Field Study by Peter Phillips. You might put down that newspaper for just a minute, Frank. Hmm? Oh, of, of course, dear. So this is good coffee, honey. Now, what is it going to be? That's what I want to know. Overtime or that big night out you promised me? Well, I just can't say for sure, honey. Uh, I'll phone you during the day. Look, you've been working on that Mitchell embezzlement for three months, day and night. Now that it's over, I think you'd want to celebrate. Well, I do, dear, I do. But I don't know just what this new assignment will involve. Oh, this I... is it. This is absolutely the end. You can change your job or change your wife, Frank. Oh, no, I honey... thought I married a man, not an accounting machine. <laughs> I guess I do seem like an accounting machine to Betty sometimes. Maybe she should have married a different kind of guy. Someone who likes to go out dancing and to parties all the time. And who has some kind of romantic career. The quiet life she had with me made her tense and nervous. No, more than that, neurotic. Actually, the work I did was rather interesting, although she didn't feel that way about it. Being an investigator for the accountancy branch isn't exactly like being one of those detectives as smart as Einstein and as tough as Marciano, but... We do get into some unusual situations. And now there was this new assignment the chief had given me. All I want you to do is see him, Frankie. You can be normally curious, but that's all. If you question him, make it simple. And if he gets cagey, cut it out. You're not going as an agent. You're just an errand boy. Take what he hands out and bring it back. Get on it right away. Although I got there early, the waiting room was filled with about 40 people. Forty people who seemed to have everything from Parkinson's disease to muscular atrophy. In 40 years, I'd never had anything wrong with me but a post-nasal drip, but I was prepared with the symptoms of an obscure ailment. I didn't have an appointment, but I had hardly sat down when the receptionist came over and ushered me into the office. I'll be with you in just a moment. Please sit down. Well, thank you. This is good of you, Doctor, but I was perfectly willing to wait my turn. Oh, I'm entitled to use my own discretion. You're an interesting case. And please don't call me Doctor. In the healing profession, that title is reserved for those who have taken the Hippocratic Oath. My name is Trancor. Mm -hmm. You said uh, I'm an interesting case. How do you know about my case? You've never seen me before. My receptionist has intuitive diagnostic ability. Now, what are your symptoms? It seems you should be able to tell me. Well, let's say the recital is part of the treatment. But if you'd rather not bother, just take this capsule in water. But this is ridiculous. How do I know... You don't. I make no claims. You can take the capsule or leave it. How many tokens... Uh, I mean, uh, how much money do you have with you? Now, listen, doctor. No, I'm not a doctor. How much? Oh, about $50, I suppose. Well, give me 25 for the capsule, which you take on faith, if you take it. Well? All right, I'll take it. I'm afraid that's all there is to report, Chief. It's all right. All we really wanted was the capsule. Have you gotten the report? Yes, and it took the laboratory five hours to break it down. Just a harmless protein solution. Two other investigators got the same thing. What about the genuine patients? They get a solution of water and a vegetable dye. 
They're both useless, but when he spots an investigator, he tries to give our lab men a headache. Well, if he prescribes useless medicines, can't Trent Corp be booked for fraud? Oh, he doesn't make any claims for the blaster thing. How come he's on our level? Why the accountancy branch? Could be anybody's case. But every time a direct law enforcement agency has tried to investigate, the man has disappeared. They think we may be more discreet. What else do we know? A great deal. Then again, nothing. We have reports from law agencies and medical societies in London, Paris, Berlin, and Prague. Oh, that reminds me. Miss Hans, please ask Sir Greville to come in now. He sets up in business. Word of his cures gets around, he becomes a sensation, and then disappears. Thank you for waiting, Sir Greville. Uh, this is Frank Paik, who will be in charge of our investigation. Uh, how do you do? Frank, this is Sir Greville Gray, chairman of the English Medical Association. How do you do, sir? Suppose you tell Paik your own experience with Trancor, Sir Greville. Well, uh, after conferring with my colleagues in other countries, I managed to have an interview with him when he set up shop in London. He's an impudent little devil. Called me the chief witch doctor. When I said we'd prosecute, he flatly denied that he practiced medicine at all. What about the capsules? He said he simply offered the capsules because people expected something material. He said it made no difference whether they took them or not. In a word, he disclaims everything, even success. Perhaps legally he's in the clear. You mentioned his success. Do you credit him with success? I think he's a faker and a fraud. But some reputable doctors report that their own patients seem to have been cured of advanced leukemia, peritonitis, and appendicitis. That's why we must investigate these uh, fantastic rumors as a professional and public duty. Well, just what do you want me to do, Chief? Find out all you can. Have them watch, check with patients, and stay with it. He may disappear at any time. This is a fine time for an assignment like this. My wife is about ready to get a psychiatrist or another husband. I'm sorry, Frankie, but you're the only one I can trust on a thing like this, and it shouldn't take long. Okay, Chief. Uh, you have a cigarette? Mine seem to be all gone. No wonder. I smoked half a dozen while we've been talking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I do smoke too much. Probably what causes this post-nasal drip. But... Say, that's funny. What? My head is cleared up. My nasal drip is gone. Since I saw Trancor this morning. Yeah? Oh, it probably cleared up by itself. But I've had it for years. Well, I hope you're right. Now, look, sweetheart, I know I practically promised, but I can't make it tonight. I've been hearing that over and over. But, darling, this is a special case. It's detective work. The police are helping me. Oh! So you think you're a real G-man now, huh? Mm. A big, tough hero running around with a bottle of rye and a blonde. Oh, sweetie. Listen, hero, I hope they shoot first. I'm through. Oh, it's nothing like that, honey. Now, you're just upset and unreasonable. Now, look, I'll try to be home early. I'll call Don't you. Don't bother. I won't be here. I heard from an old school friend today, and since you're going to be busy, I may as well go out. Oh, but baby, listen. I'll see to you me. around town. And if you do get home early, don't wait up. <laughs> I was alone in the office all evening, thinking about Betty, thinking about Trancor. I remembered Betty's crack about a bottle of rye, so I called the liquor store and had them send up a pint. Every now and then I got a call from a detective saying they were still watching the office. Then there was a call from another detective saying that he had picked up Trancor at the entrance of the office building and trailed him to a hotel just off Broadway. I took down the number and was about to leave when the first detective called again. He said they were still waiting at the office door and that there was still no sign of Trancor. I didn't try to explain. I didn't want to think about it. What could I say, that he flew out the window? I took another drink of rye and went to the hotel. As I got there, a figure came out of the building. I wasn't sure, but I followed him. Uh, good evening, Mr. Pake. How are your nasal passages? Fine, thank you. I mean, uh, yes, they're better. Walk with me, won't you? But first signal your policeman that he needn't follow us. All right. All right, now tell me something, will you? Am I mad? No, you're more sane than most. Your higher critical centers are momentarily dulled by fatigue and alcohol, giving full rein to your intuition. An endearing quality when allied with imagination. The saving grace, indeed, of your race. You're from India, aren't you? 
Trancor is a good Indian name. Incidentally, fatigue is a disease. Now, don't cure me. I don't want to wake up. Let me close my eyes a minute. Are you still here? Did you expect me to disappear? I could quite easily, by convincing you of my non-presence, as I did when I walked past those men outside my office. Don't you want to ask me some questions? Maybe I do, but why do you want to answer them? Well, you figure I'm harmless, huh? Like my wife does. And by no means. I went about to conclude my own particular investigation. I would say that you were most dangerous to me. Your imagination is quite highly developed. You know, all of a sudden, I'm not drunk at all anymore. And I need a drink. Come on, let's go in here. Very well. A double rye, please. The same. Oh, uh, just leave the bottle. Ah, that's better. I was thirsty. You drank half the bottle. I make sure to eliminate the poisons in the alcohol, thus the toxic effects. As a rule, I don't drink, but when in Rome... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember reading a story once. You're from the future. Your imagination deserves something better than comic strips to work on. It's fascinating but depressing to see science negated by superstition. Your concept of time is the greatest superstition. Well, now let's go back. You did cure my post-nasal drip, didn't you? The infection was cured by your body. I helped. I can't tell you how unless you have 500 years to spare. Well, I don't. I haven't got 12 hours to spare. If I'm to save my job, my reputation, or my wife. But I do need some answers to a pretty lengthy questionnaire. Who, when, what, why, and where? You're convinced I'm a telepath? Well, aren't you? Not in your sense of the term. When you came into my waiting room, I knew you were not there as a patient. Your presence was in disharmony. As for your name and occupation, they naturally blazed so clearly on the surface of your mind that even your native clairvoyance could read the information. Well, that takes a load off my mind. Are you too big for me to understand? We'll see. I'm just looking at that girl over there. What a pity. Three quarters of her right lung is gone. Yeah? Well, you could put her right. Well, I could stop the infection. But she would return to that back room full of smoke and dust. She'd still travel on a crowded subway to an overheated office... She'd still starve herself to buy clothes to keep in fashion. I don't have a cure for those things. Well, that's the first time I've heard you admit you have a cure for anything. What are you, Mr. Trancorn? A healer. That is my profession. Why do you bother to do anything? Well, even a healer must eat, you know. And field research is expensive. Of course, I could obviously earn sufficient of your tokens for subsistence by gambling. But that would not be ethical. You could teach... What? Run afoul of your witch doctors? Besides, these techniques have taken me 500 years to learn. Well, that's why I thought... That I was from the future? Well, I might be in terms of possibility. We are no older than you are as a race, in terms of universal evolution, but as individuals, we are longer lived. The biggest single advance you will make as a race will be when you increase the lifespan of the individual. You could help us. We could, but that must be achieved by your own efforts. Are we so contemptible in your eyes? Of course not. Would we study you if you were? Our architects, our musicians, even our fiction writers do field work in this territory and write scholarly theses when they return. Anthropology, in our sense of the term, embraces all the arts and sciences. We are scholars. Occasionally, we innovate and you benefit. Why do you want to tell me this? Frankly, I like you. You have imagination enough to control your terrestrial chauvinism, your natural resentment of being studied. It may comfort you to know that in the physical sciences, your race is considered quite well advanced. Well, thank you. And come to think of it, I do resent being a bug under your microscope. I hate it. I could kill you. But you won't. Others would. Now you understand why our visits are unannounced will be until all men are as essentially civilized, that is to say, non-aggressive, as you are. How do you come here? I know what you're wondering. But now, no, I don't have a spaceship garaged anywhere. 
You see, we don't travel. We, um, we arrive. I'm afraid the distinction is not clear to you, but it'll have to do. Now, I must go to work. I have only eight hours. Will you be my guide? What do you want to see? The city at play in the pre-dawn hours. I think my wife would suit you better in the role of a guide. She's playing pretty hard right now. And this situation makes you unhappy? Well, yes, of course it does. I guess I'm not overly emotional, but I do love Betty. I want her to be happy with me. Oh, she frets and nags, and she's hard to please, but she's not really like that. She keeps herself busy with trivial things. It's as if she were afraid of important things. And what are the important things? Well, I don't know exactly. Uh, helping people some way or other, I guess. You have any idea where your wife might be? Well, there are a couple of nightclubs she likes. Mm, could we go there a little later? No, don't worry. I promise there'll be no unpleasant consequences if we meet. But now, let's get going. <laughs> We made the early morning rounds of Manhattan. The bars, nightclubs, penny arcades. We played a pinball machine and I watched the steel ball hit the prize number 25 times. We quit bowling after his second straight 300 game. And I didn't even bother to pick up a cue in the billiard parlor. Then we went to the Clover Club. Where I saw Betty at a table in a low, low-cut evening gown. She was sitting with a big curly-haired guy who looked like an ex-football player who was wearing shoulder pads under his jacket. You see her? Yes, there she is, in that practically non-existent dress. Would you consider me uncivilized if I poked that big dope in the eye? Let's go over. And remember, you're not altogether without blame in this development. You make insufficient allowance for her. You're reasonably well-adjusted. She's not. Hi, Betty. Frankie. Frankie, where did you come from? Who's your friend? Excuse me, please. Uh, I have to make a phone call. I think I have Frankie, to... please get me a cab so I can go home. Go home? All right, dear. I'll be waiting for you. Hurry as soon as you can. I mean, when you're finished with your work. It's beautiful here. Watching the lights on the river. How do you feel? My head is clear, but I'm a little drunk from the neck down. It's like a dream. I wish sometimes I could escape reality so easily by imparting to it the patina of a dream. You can all do that. I almost envy you. Look, the dawn is coming up. The stars are fading. Yes. It's time for me to say goodbye, Mr. Pick. But can you... Can you at least tell me which star? You haven't seen it or named it yet. Promise to take care of Mr. Trancor for me, won't you? Make sure that he gets safely home. Find his address in this pocket. Goodbye, Mr. Trancor. Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> That's the way it happened, Chief. The body collapsed in my arms there on the bridge. When it came to, the man was Chandra Trancor, a second-rate doctor who disappeared from Madras ten months ago. How do you expect anyone to believe that? Those doctors and cops can examine the poor devil till they drive him crazy, but he can't tell them anything. He has less idea where he's been these past ten months than they have. How do you explain it? I don't. And I'd like you to hurry through my resignation, Chief. That's what you want. I want to be free to take legal action for Trancor if those witch doctors have him arrested on some phony charge. I'll take personal responsibility for seeing him home to India. You don't have to resign. I'll fix special leave if you insist on being crazy. Well, that's not all, though, Chief. You see, I'm taking an intensive two-year course for a new career. Yes, you told me. I thought you were drunk. What's Betty going to think of a fool idea like that? If her nerves are on edge now, this is enough to drive anyone daffy. No, 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 no. She's all for it. She really is. After all, a neurosis is a disease, and she met Trancor. Well, all right. Let me know how you're getting along. A letter from Pake, Miss Hans. Hmm. From the 
a Bello Medical Mission up at Congo. Hmm. It's been three years since we heard from Pake. This is probably the most backward tribe mentally and physically in all Africa. Some trouble with the witch doctors at first, but they're beginning to trust me with Betty's help. The women here love her, and she finds the tribal customs fascinating. Watch out for my name in the Anthropological Review. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Operation Stinky by Clifford D. Simak. What is man's best friend? The answer was so vital that every possible resource that could be found had to be poured into this one great project. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Field Study, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Peter Phillips and adapted for radio by Jack Wilson. Featured in our cast were Terry Keene, Les Damon, Santos Ortega, Alfred Shirley, and Kermit Murdoch. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Can you identify the NBC bandstand jingle jangler? He or she is a famous personality, and you may win $1,000 if you can identify him. To enter the NBC bandstand jingle jangler contest, send a postcard with your name and address and phone number to NBC bandstand, box 515, New York, 19, New York. Enter today. NBC takes you across the nation, around the world, with news on the hour, and the hotline service all day, every day on most of these stations.